Welcome to True Paranormal, the podcast with your host, Leo Rizzuti. Every week we will explore such topics as ghosts, demons, poltergeist, haunted history, time shifts, cryptozoology, and other aspects of the paranormal through listener-submitted accounts, documentary studies, and interviews with the investigators that dedicate their lives to searching for proof of the unknown. So get a fresh cup of coffee, dim the lights, relax, and get ready for a short visit to the realm of the true paranormal. Hi guys, Leo Rizzuti here. Welcome to another trip into the realm of the true paranormal. I have to apologize on the front. I'm getting over a little bit of a head cold this week, so if I kind of sound like a mixture of Mufasa and Pee Wee Herman, a little nasally this week, I do apologize about that. But at any rate, I am really, really excited about doing this episode with you guys. I am going to be getting into doing some educational stuff, which is kind of my background a little bit. I was a trainer in the Marine Corps, and I was a trainer with a couple of different businesses that I worked with, so I've kind of gotten into that gear of I'm going to teach people stuff. So as much as we want to entertain folks, we also want to educate people, and that's what a lot of this episode is going to be uh, geared towards. This week, we're going to be examining just what it means when we say the word ghost and looking into a couple of varieties of hauntings that we might run into. Hopefully, it'll help us clarify some terms that we use on our broadcast and maybe get us all on the same page. After all, I feel like this is as much, if not more, you guys' show as it is mine, since we share your guys' stories that you send, and I basically just make goofy remarks at the end of them. So are you folks ready? Awesome. Let's not waste any more time and jump right into our show. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines a ghost as a disembodied soul, especially the soul of a dead person believed to be an inhabitant of the unseen world or to appear to the living in bodily likeness. Wow, that's kind of a mouthful. Now that we have that out of the way, what do we generally mean when we say the word ghost? You know, it can have several different meanings, the variety of which leads not only to confusion in discussions, but it also kind of hampers serious study on the phenomenon. If you think about it, you know, how are you going to set yourself up to study something when folks are unable to even quantify what it is that they're going to be studying? It helps us to all be on the same page and it helps us to all know exactly what we're going to be going after when we go to examine something. Going forward, let us accept then that the term ghost should be defined, at least in my opinion, as a remnant of the existence of a physical being that has usually passed on. There are instances, because folks will say, well, why do you say usually? We have found instances where people have seen apparitions and seen ghosts, either through doppelgangers or through time shifts, things like that, that we would still consider hauntings without the person actually being deceased. That goes more into the realm of residual hauntings more than anything else, or like I said, doppelgangers, things like that. But there are enough instances of it to where we have to put in the word usually. This definition allows for multiple types of haunting activity, you know, including everything from just basic sounds to the more stereotypical apparitions. Within the scope of defining ghosts, we have to consider that the massive confusion mainly comes from trying to classify types of hauntings, not necessarily ghosts, and what is the root cause. This is where we need to focus, and that's where we're going to be concentrating our efforts on this episode and on future episodes. Now that we've defined what we mean by the word ghost, we kind of need to drill down a little bit and maybe look at the different types of phenomenon where we find ghosts, in other words, hauntings. In my personal experience, hauntings take two broad forms, either active or conscious hauntings, and passive or more commonly known as residual hauntings. These are two very different types of activity and they both need to be approached differently. The distinction between these two is also where there's the most disagreement that we find in the world of haunting investigations. Keeping that in mind, understand that I'm going to be going forward speaking of my own personal study and experiences, also a little bit combined with what other people have done, but mainly my own experience and how I have classified things during my career. I've found that very few people agree totally on these areas, and I expect that many of you will not therefore necessarily agree with me totally 100%. 
To those of you that disagree, please feel free to comment on it. I'm always excited to try and gain a little better understanding of the world of the paranormal, and there's no better way than to exchange ideas and concepts with other folks who have put in just as much time and energy into studying the world of the paranormal. You know, that's how we all grow together. The biggest difference that we find between the two types of hauntings is one of intelligence or intent. Simply put, an active haunting is one where evidence can be found of an intellect behind whatever the entity happens to be, whereas a residual type of haunting has apparently no intellect behind it. It's just a thing that happens over and over and over again, and you can't communicate with it and you can't get a response from it. Let's look first at what is a residual haunting. A residual haunting can take many forms. Everything from footsteps to knocks to voices or even smells and apparitions can be part of a residual haunting. The thing to remember is how a residual haunting is first formed. Looking at the evidence that has been extensively gathered from thousands of residual hauntings, one common thing stands out that unites all of them. They all seem to be tied into a singular traumatic event that is the catalyst for the haunting itself. This event can be as simple as maybe an intense argument, uh, as violent as a murder or suicide, or even as complicated as you know an act of war or even religious activities. The important thing to remember is that all of these are events that include strong emotional energies. Now, my theory, personally, and that that is all that it is at this time, is my theory, is that these types of events create a sort of etching in space-time, or to a certain extent possibly onto objects nearby or that are involved. It's kind of similar to a vinyl record being etched by sound vibrations, or to a recording on film. The only difference between those recordings and a residual haunting is that the medium that they are recorded on. A record has, you know, has vinyl, and a film has cellulose or uh, whatever kind of film that you're using to record on, whereas a residual haunting is made on the fabric of space-time. And I know that kind of sounds a little metaphysical. I'm, I apologize about that, but that's really the only frame of reference I have is that it's the fabric of space-time. Or as I said, every once in a while you'll get it where it's actually on an object that's been involved. These hauntings are marked by regular occurrences. You know, usually we'll see the same phenomenon repeated over and over again and at the same time and at the same location. One great example of this type of haunting is the famous Mako Light in Mako, North Carolina. This one has a special significance to me personally because I have an uncle who took a trip out there and was successful in experiencing it. Think about that. That's how regular and predictable this haunting was, that people could literally take a day trip knowing that it would show up at a certain time and place and they could experience it without thinking, oh, I wasted my time. Uh, because of that, it's one of the most studied and documented hauntings of all time. Scientists have set up recordings for it, and they've gotten film of it. They've looked at it. They couldn't explain it. So they just kind of shrugged their shoulders and left. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at it with this account uh, that we've gotten written by Jim McAmos. In the years immediately following the Civil War, the railroad was king. And if the railroad was king, its prince was the conductor. The engineer might have gotten to sit up front, blow the whistle, and drive the train, but he couldn't move that train one inch until the conductor told him to. Joe Baldwin had always wanted to be a conductor. One day, he finally realized his lifelong dream when he was hired to be a conductor on the Wilmington and Manchester line. The W and M stretched from the coastal town of Wilmington, North Carolina, westward to Columbia, South Carolina, and then now to Charleston, a town that Joe loved, never tiring of visiting. The beautiful homes, the water, and huge helpings of fried chicken and sweet potato pie that his friends cooked for him, it just made his mouth water thinking about it. Joe would appear at work every morning, smartly turned out in his clean, pressed black pants, starched white shirt, black leather vest, and expertly tied bow tie. On top of his head was the conductor's hat, with a medallion on the front that glistened like gold in the sunlight and read, Conductor. He always carried his lantern with him, along with a ticket punch and, of course, his railroad watch. For it was with that watch that Joe made his train run on time. Joe took very good care of his train. Several times during the run, Joe would walk from one end of the train to the other, checking everything that he could think of. 
He would check the wheels to see if there was foreign objects from the tracks that were stuck on them. He would check the boxcars to make sure they were properly locked. He would make sure that the passengers had everything that they needed and that there were always enough oil for the lamps, of course, so they wouldn't burn out at night. One stormy night, as they were traveling through the swampy woods near Mako, North Carolina, which is a town a few miles west of Wilmington, Joe was back in the caboose, resting. He had just completed his rounds and wanted to take a short break before they reached South Carolina. Dreams of Charleston danced in his head as the clickety-clack of the train wheels lulled him to sleep. Suddenly, the train started slowing down, and Joe instinctively woke up in a flash. He immediately got worried, for he knew it wasn't time to stop anywhere yet. He jumped up, ran to the front of the caboose, opened the door, and stepped out onto the next coach. But there was no next coach. Joe was horrified to see that the caboose he had been riding in had somehow become uncoupled from the rest of the train. Somewhere in the distant darkness, the rest of his beloved train had left him behind. Joe knew right then he was in trouble, because right behind his train, he knew that a fast freight train would soon be approaching. Joe ran out onto the rear landing and peered through the rain and the fog, trying desperately to spot the train. Before long, way off in a distance, he saw a pinpoint of light, and he knew that it had to be the freight train behind him. As the light got bigger, he could almost hear the wheels of the freight trugging towards him, louder and louder. Joe grabbed his lantern and started waving it frantically from side to side, hollering, Hey! Stop! Hey! He knew that the freight engineer couldn't hear him, but he screamed anyway, waving his lantern wilder and wilder. The freight light grew bigger and bigger, and Joe heard the whooshing sound of the air brakes, then the sound of the freight locomotive going into reverse, its wheels spinning on the track. He saw the sparks flying off either side of the track like some surreal fireworks display that was the last thing that Joe Baldwin saw. For the freight train smashed into his caboose with a deafening crash, splintering it into a million pieces. Then there was silence on the tracks, save for the steam hissing from the freight train. The only light available was from Joe Baldwin's lantern, which had been thrown deep into the dark swamp and continued to burn throughout the night. The next morning, the people that came to search for the wreckage finally found Joe's mangled body near the caboose. To their horror, they found that he had been decapitated in the crash. They searched throughout the woods, but never could find his head, only his lantern, still warm to the touch. They carried Joe home and buried him without his head. A few weeks later, the station master at Mako stepped out onto the platform on another dark and foggy night. As he looked down the tracks, he thought he saw a little pinpoint of light coming towards him. He checked his watch. There wasn't supposed to be any train arriving then. The light kept moving down the tracks as if it were someone carrying a lantern. Then it started to swing back and forth, slowly at first, but as it got closer to the station, it started to swing wilder and wilder. And then it suddenly turned and went back down the tracks until it disappeared into the darkness. The station master didn't know what to make of it at first and eventually dismissed it from his mind. But then the light started coming back more and more, mainly on nights when there was stormy weather. Again, it would start off as a tiny point, growing larger as it approached, and swinging back and forth like a lantern, getting wilder and wilder. Then, as it neared the station, it would turn around and go back into the woods. The station master wasn't the only one who saw the light. Engineers approaching Mako would see it alongside the tracks, and would stop their train thinking it was a signal. They finally had to make a special rule at Mako where any signals to any train had to be done with two lights instead of just one, and any single light signals were to be ignored. Folks began coming into Mako from all over to see what became known as the Mako light. Scientists even tried studying it to come up with a plausible theory, but never could figure it out. Some folks said that it was ball lightning or maybe swamp gas. In later years, some believed that it was maybe automobile headlights reflecting off the tracks in 1977 when the railroad shut down the line and tore up the tracks. When the tracks left, apparently so did the light, and it hasn't reappeared since. Whether Joe Baldwin found his head or found some other measure of peace, that was the last anyone ever saw of the Mako light. So there you go. That was the Mako Light. It's a phenomenon witnessed by thousands of people, ranging from simple railroad employees to even President Grover Cleveland. 
one of the most interesting aspects of this specific haunting is not only did it last for as long as it did, which is over 100 years, uh, Joe Baldwin lost his life in 1867, and the phenomena was last seen in 1977, so that's 110 years, which also, if you think about it, one of the theories that the scientists came up with was, well, it must be the reflection of headlights. Well, there were no headlights in 18. the 1870s or 80s or 90s or, you know, any of those years that it was witnessed. But, you know, it also, as I said, it stopped abruptly in 1977 when the railroad tracks were removed. This kind of leads credence to the idea that the residual haunting itself, and I do believe that this was a residual haunting, was etched not only into the space-time, uh, but also possibly into the tracks themselves. Uh, and there's actually a theory that the phenomenon was energized continuously by uh, and sustained by the static electricity that's generated by continually passing trains. It stands as one of the best examples of a residual haunting ever documented to this day. The other type of common haunting, if you can call any haunting that is common, is an active haunting. This uh, type is made remarkable by the fact that the entity that is doing the haunting can usually be communicated with and that the activity is more sporadic and unpredictable than what we find in a residual haunting. This is the type of haunting that most people think about when they envision a haunting. And it's also the type that's the easiest to classify incorrectly. The main reason for the struggle in classification stems largely from the idea of what abilities a ghost or spirit might have to begin with. To some, any time that you communicate with a non-physical entity, you are not dealing at that time with a ghost, but you're dealing with another entity that's possibly masquerading as a ghost. That theory says that people's spirits aren't locked into locations that if you're able to communicate with them, you're not talking to a deceased person, you're talking to something else altogether. To others, active hauntings are simply the product of lost spirits or deceased people, or you know, even sometimes animals, who have decided to not move on for whatever reason, often because they feel a strong connection towards either a piece of property or a loved one, or again, every once in a while, an object. Oftentimes, these hauntings are marked with evidence including uh, electronic voice phenomenon, also known as EVPs, uh, orbs, cold spots, and occasionally apparitions, but also by the fact that the activity noted seems to end fairly quickly, at least in comparison to their longer-lasting residual counterparts. One of the most famous of these types of hauntings is the strange case of the Greenbrier ghost, and I'd like to give a hat tip to Elizabeth Tilstra, who wrote this account that we're going to be hearing now. In the winter of 1897 in Greenbrier County, West Virginia, Mary Jane Hester claimed to be visited by the ghost of her deceased daughter. Elva Zona Hester Shue had passed away suddenly a month earlier. Her body was found by a neighbor boy on January 23rd. A hasty autopsy concluded that she had died of everlasting faint. Mary Jane was distraught over the death of her daughter, yet her strange visions offered much more than solace for her grief. In these midnight visits, Zona's ghost told Mary Jane that her death had been neither natural nor an accident. She had been murdered by her husband, Erasmus Edward Stribling Trout Shoe. Zona's death was suspicious from the start, yet nothing definitively proved Edward's culpability. In the time it took the neighbor boy to notify the police and for a doctor to arrive, Edward had cleaned and dressed the body of his dearly departed wife. That was odd, considering that preparing Zona's corpse was a job traditionally left for the mother and other women. Odder still, Shu disallowed the doctor from completing the autopsy. At the wake, he kept careful watch over the body, propping pillows and sheets around Zona's head with a scarf wrapped around her neck. He claimed that she would rest easier this way. Zona was buried on January 24, 1897. After the funeral, her mother removed the cheat from inside the coffin and, after Edward refused it, took the linen home to wash. But when she dropped the sheet into a basin of water, the water turned dark red. The bloody sight suggested that Zona's death had been no accident. Yet, Mary Jane still hesitated in accusing her son-in-law. That is, until her daughter's ghost appeared in her bedroom. Over the course of four nights, Zona's spirit returned to her mother's room, sharing the grisly details of her murder at the hands of her abusive husband. The ghost told Mary Jane that Shu had broken her neck, turning her head all the way around 
to prove it. Mary Jane took the information to the police. Her strange testimony was enough to have the body exhumed for a second autopsy. On February 22, 1897, medical professionals examined Zona's body once more, this time without the interference of her husband. They found that Zona's windpipe was crushed and her ligaments were torn, with gouge marks left on her skin. Her neck had clearly been broken by force. Soon thereafter, Edward was arrested and charged with murdering his wife. During the trial, Edward's attorney made the mistake of thinking that Mary Jane's paranormal testimony would weaken her case. However, her story held up against a cross-examination, and the judge had a hard time convincing the jury to disregard the touching tale of a daughter's visits from beyond the grave. On July 11th, Edward was found guilty of murdering Zona and sentenced to life in prison. He died three years later from an unknown illness and was buried in an unmarked grave. Mary Jane Hester lived another 19 years, never wavering on the veracity of her story. As for her daughter's spirit, the Greenbrier ghost, she never appeared at her mother's bedside again. Perhaps it was because she had finally found peace. So there you go, the case of the Greenbrier ghost. Not only is this an excellent example of an active haunting, but it also stands apart as the only instance where testimony of a ghost was entered into evidence during a trial leading to a conviction. Very remarkable to say the least. Uh, this has uh, several of the markers we look for in an active haunting, including physical phenomenon, recurring apparitions, uh, intelligence conversation and information, and of course a quick ceasing of haunting activity after the spirit's apparent work is done. So you can see the difference between the two types of haunting. In the Greenbrier case, we have uh, an active haunting where a ghost is obviously communicated with, that we get some information, we have a little bit of back and forth. Uh, and you see that oftentimes when you hear people talk about haunting investigations, they'll actually ask questions to get EVPs. What they're looking for is they're looking for an active haunting. They're looking for something with enough intelligence that it can recognize that they're calling out to them and hopefully we're responding kind and maybe we catch some evidence um you don't necessarily or you're not necessarily able to tell the difference right in that moment between a residual and an active haunting because you can have footsteps occur in both kinds whereas you know in a residual what you'll do is you'll hear footsteps pacing back and forth or something like that at a specific time to where you can almost time it. Whereas with an active one, you might, you know, you'll be in a, in a haunted location and maybe you'll hear footsteps above or you'll hear furniture moving or something like that. And you go up there and there's nothing there and it doesn't occur all the time. It just happens every once in a while. So there's a little, little bit of a difference there. Uh, but the Greenbrier case, I think is a, is a great example of the active kind, even though it's an older account and, uh, it's really famous though because of the fact that if the testimony was good enough and think about it if a if a spirit came to you and said hey this is how I was murdered and you had no idea you you had no way to examine the body but when they dug the body up if that what the spirit information had been given to you if that came back as accurate that would kind of blow some people's minds I know it it would blow my mind if that happened to me so um it's a great example of an active haunting and one that we can look at as kind of a baseline for all other active hauntings going forward. Well, I hope that you guys have enjoyed this little educational trip down the hallways of the paranormal. In future episodes, we're going to be examining a couple of other types of haunting phenomenon. Poltergeists, which are probably not what you think that they are. Uh, if, if all you're familiar with is the movie Poltergeist. And of course, everybody's favorite subject, demons. We'll also be sharing, of course, the stories sent in by you guys, so keep them coming in. Just go to our Facebook page at True Paranormal, the podcast, hit that like button, and then be sure to hit that email button and share your personal accounts with us. We'd love to include them in one of our future broadcasts. As always, of course, if you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to share them or post them on the link to this broadcast. Uh, we love hearing from you guys. It is great to get feedback from you and it also helps us to learn and to grow in the meantime this is leo rizzuti and i want to thank all of you for hanging out with us this weekend every week look for us next week at the same time for another episode of true paranormal the podcast